The scripture reading for today is from Luke 2, beginning with verse 21. Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering, as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man named Simeon who lived in Jerusalem. He was a righteous man and very devout. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he eagerly expected the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Lord, now I can die in peace. As you promised me, I have seen the Savior you have given to all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Joseph and Mary were amazed at what was being said about Jesus. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, This child will be rejected by many in Israel, and it will be their undoing. But he will be the greatest joy to many others. Thus, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. She was a widow, for her husband had died when they had been married only seven years. She was now 84 years old. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about Jesus to everyone who had been waiting for the promised king to come and deliver Jerusalem. When Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements <clears throat> of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee. There the child grew up healthy and strong. He was filled with wisdom beyond his years, and God placed his special favor upon him. Christmas is over. Twelve days of Christmas is a real thing. And tomorrow, January 6th, is the Epiphany. Uh, Twelve days of Christmas, and then comes uh, January 6th Epiphany, which simply, well, it, it's the dawning of the light, the light appearing of the light. We say, it dawned on me, a light went on. That's Epiphany, and that's t tomorrow. So this is Epiphany Sunday. It's the closest to it. Um, the Gospels give us only two snapshots of Jesus as a boy. They're both in Luke. There's the one where Joseph and Mary take Jesus to the temple when he's 12. Today's story happens earlier. He's only a few days old. Um, when Joseph and Mary take Jesus to the temple for the very first time. And so the first four verses that we heard today set up the story, set the stage. Uh, when Jesus was eight days old, he would have been circumcised. Uh, that would have happened at home, typically surrounded by family and friends. It was a sign of the Jewish covenant with God. And then came the trip to the temple in Jerusalem where they would make a purification offering 
uh, to cleanse the mother after the birth of a child. And then the child dedication, kind of like our child dedications, except if the woman's first child was a boy, uh, there would be an offering given, uh, a special calf or sheep, or in the case of poor parents like this, a pigeon or a dove, or a couple of doves. These rituals seem strange to us, but that was part, part of normal Jewish life for a young family. Um, so why is this story here? The other Gospels don't record it. And of all the stories Luke could have told, he chose this one. Um, I think it points to the very humanness of Jesus. Um, Jesus was no superhuman baby. Uh, when that sharp knife touched his sensitive skin, I'm sure he howled as little boys have howled for thousands of years. And no doubt the old people smiled and said, my, that boy has good lungs. Um, that was just part of Jewish life. And so now it's time for a trip to the temple. Babies don't often travel well. So, but this is what you do. And so bundle them up and pack extra diapers and here we go. It's every new parent did this. Sometimes we'd like our religion to be a little less mess, messy, a little less earthbound. A few more angels maybe or some special worship experiences. But what God gives us is ordinary. The regular stuff of life and worship and maybe Luke is reminding us that it's in those everyday normal routines of our own stories, if we pay attention, that's where we'll find God, or maybe better, that's where God finds us, if we pay attention. And that brings us to Simeon. He's an old man living in Jerusalem. He's been waiting and praying for the Messiah that would come and rescue Israel. And for them, this wasn't a kind of a like, I sure wish. It was kind of a desperation thing. God, we are um, a captive people. They were living under the iron fist of the Roman Empire. And it was a cry of desperation. Lord, save us. And somehow the Lord had told him that he would not die until he would see the Messiah. And somehow that Sunday or actually Sabbath, the Spirit prompted him to go to the temple. I guess he didn't go there every day, maybe not even every Sabbath, but that day the Spirit prompted him to go. There's no mention of a vision or a voice. It's kind of like when you get up in the morning and think, you know what, I should call that person, or um, we should go to home group tonight. It's been a busy week, but today we should go. Um, and so Simeon goes to the temple. And among all the people there, he notices a young couple with their child. And somehow he just knows. He just knows this is the one. And he gently takes the ba baby and he can't contain himself. And he says, Lord, now I can die in peace. As you promised me, I have seen the Savior you've given to all people. He's the light to reveal God to the nations, and he's the glory of your people Israel. Simeon has been waiting most of his life for this moment. But did you notice what he's been waiting for? And the words that come out of his mouth don't match. We've just been told he's been waiting for a Messiah to rescue Israel. And what he says is, Lord, I've seen the Savior you've given to all people. He's the light to reveal God to the nations, even our enemy nations. Do you understand how big a shift that is? All of Simeon's categories have just been blown up. He thought the Messiah was for us, the Jewish people. And now, just like that, he's a savior of everybody? Anybody? 
I want to park here for a bit. How do we understand this? How is Jesus the light among all nations? Well, we say we, they, we have to tell them the gospel. Tell them about Jesus. Well, last week we talked about the wise men um, who studied the stars and they went back to their charts and they concluded a new king had been born. Here was a God already at work among Eastern worshipers who probably had no knowledge of the Jewish faith. After all, they went to King Herod to find out where this king would be born. And when he asked the biblical scholars of the day, they knew, but these astrologers didn't. This week, I went looking in our church library for this book, Peace Child. I found it. Um, It's not a new book. But I see by the little card, this book has never been read. And I'm thinking, this book ought to be required reading. Anyway, Peace Child, it's it's by Don Richardson. Uh, He and his wife, Carol, were missionaries in Irian Jaya, a remote tribe in uh, western Indonesia. This tribe was, the Sawi tribe was known especially for their violence and their cannibalism. The Richardsons settled in an area, and there were three villages almost within sight of each other. Um, And there was such, they tried to make peace between these tribes, but they couldn't. They they saw blood almost every day. Uh, The violence between the resentments and the revenge killings and stuff like that, there was, they saw blood almost every day. And that was besides the, just the normal stuff that happened in homes when a husband would shoot an arrow through his wife's arm or leg because he didn't like something he'd done. So the, 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 the culture was just steeped in violence. And so they told the stories of Jesus who came to bring peace and they got nowhere. It made no impression. And then he told about how Jesus had walked with his disciples for three years And then one of his disciples, Judas, betrayed him, and he was killed. And the warriors cheered. Yay! What a betrayal! Judas was the hero of the story. If you could fatten a pig up and lead that pig to a good life and then have a feast at the pig's expense, if you do that with a friend, what a betrayal! So how do you tell the gospel in a culture like that? But the constant violence and war was hard on the people, and somehow they still longed for peace. And so one day, they, one evening, they told Don Richardson, tomorrow we will sprinkle cool water on our enemies. And by that they meant tomorrow we'll make peace. Um, so the next morning, uh, Don and Carol watched as they, these people live in tree houses, up, you know, 30 to 50 feet above the swamp, and they watched as a man climbed down his ladder carrying a small child, and he started walking to another village. And a man came down from his house and came carrying a child also. The mothers were desperate with grief, desolate with grief. But these men came to the middle and they exchanged children. These were known as, this was known as the peace child. I give you my child and you give me yours. And as long as those children live, we will be at peace. Those men went back to their villages with the children they had just received and everybody in the village put their hand on the child which pledged, I will not harm this child nor will I harm the village from which it came. And they exchanged names also. In other words, you're now my family. And they explained to Don Richardson, there can be no peace unless there's a peace child. And don't ever betray a peace child. And it clicked. Don told them about God who had sent a peace child. And suddenly they understood. 
The point Richardson makes is that every culture already has stories and metaphors and clues and hints that point to Jesus. So that brought me then thinking closer to home. How has God been at work among the First Nations of Canada, for instance? Um, a friend of mine who's, who's First Nation says, before the settlers came, the indigenous people already had the Old Testament. What were the greatest achievements of the Old Testament? The greatest achievements of the Old Testament is here, O Israel, your God is one, monotheism, one creator spirit. The indigenous people had that. The other achievement of the Old Testament is covenant. And the indigenous, indigenous people called them treaties. They were making treaties with each other, making peace between warring tribes long before the white settlers came. So when the white settlers came and said, we want to make a treaty with you, they were eager to do it. And when missionaries came and said, God wants to make a treaty with you, they understood. They already understood a creator God, and now the creator God had sent a son to make a treaty. It made sense. If you go to Kildonan Park, you'll see a, a statue of Chief Peguis. You notice he's holding a book? That's a Bible. He embraced Christianity, he learned to speak English, and then he learned to read English so he could teach the Bible to his people. He and his wife were both ordained as missionaries. He was buried in the old cemetery of St. Peter's Church um, near Selkirk. And that's where he worshipped regularly as part of his ordinary life. He got a little disillusioned with the way the Hudson Bay Company uh, broke the terms of their treaty, but he never stopped supporting the white settlers. Well, let's shift gears. How is the Spirit of God blowing among Muslim nations? And many of them, after their month of fasting in Ramadan, Ramadan they have this feast of Eid, and many of them see visions of a white man. And there are enough of them that some, some mission agencies have put out posters and say, have you seen the white man? Let us tell you about them. Here's a number to call. And I could tell you more stories, but uh, let's go on. Um, another example. We have some friends uh, from India, David Prathapati, uh, Grace Bushy, they and their family came to Canada from India via South Africa, and then MTS recruited them to an engineering position here. And they walked into our church and uh, stayed, a Christian family. One day David called me and says, I have something to show you. A series of verses from the Hindu scriptures. Now these were written between 1700 to 1000 B.C., we're talking like early Old Testament to mid-Old Testament stories, like long before King David. Scriptures that tell of a son of a, of a savior who would be the, a, a son, of, son of man and God. He would be son of God too. Through him the whole universe was created. They will cast lots for his clothing. He will be crowned with a crown of thorns. They will give him bitter drink or vinegar. They will drive nails into his hands and feet. None of his bones will be broken. He will rise again from the dead. His flesh will be given as food. His blood will be given as drink. Those are all quotes from the 10th book of the Rig Veda. There are four Vedas in, in the Hindu scriptures. And uh, the Rig Veda is the largest one. It's, and the 10th book has all these quotes in it. From at least a thousand years before Jesus. And then these quotes from the Sama Veda which was roughly 1,200 to 1,000. He'll be born of a virgin. He'll, he's from a humble background. He'll walk on water. He'll be nailed to a tree or a wooden pole. He will have five wounds. He will sit at the right hand or on the lap of his father. He is the only way to salvation. And then finally, from the Yajurveda, also 1,200 to 1,000 uh, BC, King Shaka asked, may I know who you are? 
With apparent joy, the man replied, Know that I am the Son of God. I am born in the womb of a virgin. Isa Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, is my well-known name. Folks, this is from the Hindu scriptures. And I read this, and I said to David, do they know this? He said, no, they don't know, because they don't know their scriptures, and they're not taught these things, but it's all there. Back to our text. Simeon expects someone to come and rescue Israel, the people of God. But his song speaks of a savior to all the world, given to all people, a light to reveal God to the nations. God is at work in religions and cultures, in times and places and ways beyond our imagining. And maybe that's why Luke included this story here. Why does this matter? Because it changes the way we look at people. It changes the way we look at their cultures. It changes the way we look at their religions. And we start looking for these clues. It doesn't change what we believe about Jesus, but we look for the clues that point to Jesus. Then we come to Anna, a prophet described as very old. Well, the text actually tells us how old very old is. Very old in this text is 84, um, which in those days was probably well past the average uh, life expectancy. Anna had known her share of heartache, married at, say, 15, which was normal, which was typical in those days. Her husband died seven years later when she was, what, 22? And so she has been a widow now for over 60 years. She apparently lives in the temple. Maybe she's got no other home. She spends her days and nights following the spiritual practices and disciplines of worship, prayer, and fasting. Anna just happens to come by as Simeon is talking to Mary and Joseph. And she sees the child and recognizes the answer to years of her prayers and bursts out in praise, starts dancing and, well, doesn't say that, but she's telling everybody this good news about this Jesus who is the Messiah. And maybe that kind of joy only comes when you've had a long, long, hard life. Dawn is brightest when you've had a dark night, right? Did you notice that the two people who got it in this text were both seniors? We sometimes think that vision and uh, um, comes from younger people, and it does, um, who see the world and say, why does it have to be this way and lobby for changes? But in this case, It was these two elderly people who saw and who recognized what they were seeing. This was not an ordinary baby. Babies came to the temple all the time. But this one was God's chosen world. And maybe Luke is telling us something here too. We're never too old to learn something new or to come to a new understanding of what God is up to in the world. And it all happened on on an ordinary Sunday or Sabbath, their day of worship. A day when a couple of senior saints recognized the human Jesus as God's light to the world. And their testimony, their joy, brings the whole place to life. Who knows what light and joy could break out among us on some ordinary Sunday. Whether you're young like Mary or experienced like Simeon and Anna, you might, on some ordinary Sunday like today, you might 
see and recognize or understand something new about what God is up to in the world. Something bigger, something broader, something you hadn't thought of before. You might actually have an epiphany. May God make it so. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite the team to come on up.